Hey, I'm going to stop you right there. Uh, I had everything recording except for the Zoom. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And there's no co-host today. Ian is out with his family, so uh, I'll be running this one solo, but I do have a special guest today. Uh, we recently just got back from UTV Takeover Utah uh, over in San Hollow, and I was fortunate enough to meet face-to-face, -face, finally, uh, Bud with the uh, Utah UTV Facebook group, who is now, uh, as of this last week, I believe 23,000 members strong, uh, pretty healthy, vibrant group. And uh, today we're joined by uh, Bud Burning. Bur How are you doing, Bud? Uh, I'm doing awesome. I uh, appreciate you guys having me. I follow you guys on Facebook and all your social media. You guys do an awesome job. And like you said, it was uh, pretty awesome running into you over at Takeover. Oddly enough, you were taking a picture on my machine and I happened to, happened to grab you for a minute. Uh, I know we were kind of trying to connect up and it happened to be the right place at the right time. So I, uh, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been a part of the group for a little while now. Uh, once I started kind of looking to, to be more involved with different groups across the country and, and obviously the Moab scene and, and the, uh, the desert scene out there is pretty vibrant and, and I wanted to be a part of it. Uh, up here in the Northwest, we got a pretty big group, Northwest UTV. It's about, um, I think 10, 12,000 people strong. Um, awesome. and we got a pretty good group going there. And, uh, but, uh, to have you onto the show today, we have a lot to talk about. Um, but, uh, why don't you give us the kind of the man behind the scenes? Uh, who are you? Where did you come from? How did you get into UTV and all that? <laughs> so my name is Bud Bruning. Uh, I'm with a group called UTV Utah. I started off probably just like many of you guys out there on a three-wheeler, four-wheeler. I love the outdoors. love going out with my family. And, and then uh, as time progressed on, um, I ended up in the jeeping and buggy world uh, with Moab and San Hollow in our, in our backyard here in Utah. That's kind of a given. Those are, you know, two of the kind of meccas when it comes to off-road destinations. And so I started off, um, you know, kind of, uh, I don't ever do anything kind of um, halfway. So I, I, I built a, a four-door Jeep on 40s and, and one-ton axles. And then uh, when that didn't kind of quite cut it, I, I also bought a uh, full-on buggy. And so I really come from a rock crawling background. Um, from there, you know, when the side-by-sides came out back in 2014, 2015, obviously they were out sooner, but you know, a, a little 800 with very little ground clearance was just not appealing to me. Uh, but when they came out with um, with a big machine, uh, I I bought one and learned fairly quickly that these machines are quite capable. I can be at the sand dunes and, you know, 10 minutes later, I could change the tires and be in the mountains. Uh, these machines could literally go anywhere, whether it's the sand dunes, mountains, um, it does not matter. They're very capable. And so uh, that's kind of my background. We started out uh, with UTV Utah, a little group called Utah Razor Crew. Uh, there was about a dozen of us. It was a platform for us to, you know, post content, post videos and pictures and, and rides and stuff, just about a dozen buddies. And then uh, as time grow, grows and time goes on, uh, people wanted to be involved more and more. And so we ended up having to change the name. A lot of people, you know, wanted to be involved with Utah Razor Crew, but didn't have a razor. And so we changed the name a few years ago to U UTV Utah. And since then, our... Um, our membership has just grown. It's, it's exploded. Just we, just this last week, I think we just hit over 23,000 members, uh, which is awesome. It's just been, it's been a great time. So when you guys were, uh, back in the day of the razor crew, uh, was it mostly just, you know, you and your friends and just a couple of their friends that were all just sharing ride days and, and pictures from the rides and stuff like that? It was just a bunch of buddies that went out. Some people would go to the sand dunes, you know, we would go out with the, it was probably about a dozen or two dozen of us. We'd go out riding, um, and then it would just be a place to share pictures, see who, see who could jump, see whose machine was running awesome, see you know new additions to people's machines. If you had a question or a problem with your machine, you could always ask it on there. We had, had tons of buddies that you know were always wrenching on their machines, so it was a good platform to ask for questions and troubleshooting and, and upgrades. So when we uh, had a, a podcast with the guys from the Northwest UTV crew and the originating founders and, and you know, they were talking about how the, the group organically grew just based out of every weekend, somebody writing, somebody talking, somebody sharing. Uh, and then they started doing like stickers and stuff. And all of a sudden the stickers became a, a big, huge promotion engine for them. And then they started taking off once people started connecting on Facebook. Um, kind of what was the, uh, the turning point for your guys' group when you went from that kind of core razor group, that, that, that local razor community to being a bigger group? Was there anything that you can define as kind of like the transition point for that? Yeah. So uh, it really, it, it, 
uh, it was um, stickers, and then we had 12 by 18 flags. Uh, a lot of the destinations here in Utah, you have to run a flag. So a lot of the sand dunes, you have to run a flag. So we had stickers, uh, we had flags, and the stickers did really well. Uh, but I think that was kind of what transitioned is a lot of people didn't want their Razor Crew sticker on their Can-Am. And so it was like, man, what can you do to, to make this more appealing? So when we came out with UTV Utah, we created flags and stickers and they just went, it just exploded. I mean, everybody, everybody wanted one. We, we spent some money on a, on having a cool logo design. We wanted something that, you know, if you're going to put a sticker on your machine, you want something that, you know, that doesn't look like somebody did it on, in, you know, paint or whatever homemade edition. So we did, we spent some money. We, we had it done right. We've got a cool logo and it's something that, you know, and right now still our biggest sellers are flags and stickers because they're, they're, well, there's a little bit more to it as we'll get into, I think in the podcast, there's a little right. bit more to UTV Utah now, but back then it was just, Hey, I want to be, a, I want to be a member of something that's fun. And these guys are doing cool stuff and I want to be a member of it. So that's kind of what led to the organic growth of the group. So out in Utah, uh, like over here on the West Coast, when you get out to the dunes or whatever, they'll actually have color and size, rec- you know, regulations on on what you're putting up on the pole. Over in Utah, is that something that is kind of just free form? Like you, just, as long as you have a flag, certain ho- so high off the ground, is that cool, or is it uh, they actually orange or red or whatever? So that's a great question. You have to have so many square inches of orange um, or red on top of your uh, on your flag, and so we've actually designed our flags to have just enough orange in them to make them legal in Utah. And so that's uh, that's a great question. But yes, you do have to have orange in your flag somewhere. You have to have so many square inches. And and that's statewide, right? Like in all the, all the parks? Uh, everywhere that requires a flag. A lot of places you don't need a flag, mountains, uh, that sort of thing. But there's a few places that you do need a flag. The, you know, we've got a per- pretty good area here called Little Sahara Sand Dunes in Utah. Uh, they require a flag and so does San Hollow, which are probably two of the most popular riding areas. Those two do require flags. And uh, so as far as the community goes and, and growing, um, you know, one of the questions I like to ask uh, people in these little kind of micro communities or, or niche groups, um, what are what are some of the most common topics outside of, you know, how big of a wheel can I put on a stock machine? Um, what kind of topics are you guys talking about on a frequently frequent basis in the group? So there, I think one of the things that makes our group so appealing and so helpful is the fact that in our community, we have some of the best um, shops and technicians in the entire state. Uh, these guys are, I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing. So if anybody has any questions as to, you know, um, I'm, I'm getting this noise, my shock is doing that, my transmission is doing that, it doesn't matter which machine you own. Uh, within minutes, you can have, you know, probably five or 10 replies from people that are doing this daily with some uh, very good advice. And so that's one thing that's that's awesome about it. But, you know, some of the main questions we get are, are probably similar to all the other groups, you know, which which windshield, which roll cage. And, and in Utah, we've, we've got some of the best manufacturers. Now, I know in other states, they have great manufacturers as well that, that build in shops that do some great stuff. But in Utah, we really do have some of the best uh, re- renowned uh, cage builders and shops um, in the country. And so we're in that aspect, we're actually really spoiled. But with that comes some amazing technicians and, and shops that actually know what they're doing. Yeah, I think between, uh, you know, Arizona, Utah, Idaho, Nevada, you pretty much have the entire country on lockdown on the uh, on the quality manufacturing side. We do. We're, 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 we're extremely spoiled because you know, when somebody posts a cage, you know, who's the best cage builder? We, we have probably three or four of the best ones in, in, in the country. Um, it's kind of like a Chevy versus Ford versus Dodge conversation because they're <laughs> all great. Uh, but who has the best one? And at that point, it just comes down to, you know, what is the most appealing to you? Because you're going to get a great cage no matter what. So we're going to get uh, kind of circle back to uh, the community and, and the efforts you're doing there. But let's talk a little bit about uh, the topography and the vehicles that you guys ride out there, because um, a lot of our audience is here from the Northwest where we're located. And uh, up here, we do a lot of mountain trails. We do a lot of um, kind of just in the trees stuff. And then uh, anything variant from that is typically just the dunes, right? Um, yes. And so uh, out here, you see a lot of uh, either really um, kind of like off-road cage 
builds where it's all like, you know, how many things can I bolt on? How many axes? How many chainsaws? How many whatevers? Um, or you have the guy that is pretty narrow, lightweight, and just out for a good camp and, and takes his razor with him. So, um, you know, you guys have a lot of a different approach to your topography. You got a lot of rock crawlers. You got a lot of big tires. You got a lot of uh, suspension travel. You got a lot of, you know, those types of builds that are more of um, kind of like a, a eye popper uh, scenario. Um, and, I, and I know your car, like we were saying earlier, uh, I was out taking pictures of your car. Um, pretty, pretty built up. Um, you know, kind of what, uh, what have you noticed in the, in the community as far as the cars themselves? How has it changed over the last few years? And, and uh, I know tires keep getting bigger and, and lifts get, get taller. Um, what are some of the changes that you've noticed in your area, kind of the, the trends that you're seeing in your group? So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, when it comes to Utah, uh, you know, it's, the machines are a lot like the weather. Um, they, they change a lot. And you never know what what kind of terrain you're going to be in, and so uh, we've got a lot of sand dunes. A lot of guys strictly ride the dunes, so we've got a lot of fast vehicles. Um, we've got some of the fastest side by sides in the world um, that come out of out of Utah. So as far as like the drag racing and sand dunes, we've got some incredibly fast machines. Um, but then with Moab and Sand Hollow being, you know, two of the pr premier destinations, uh, and there's a lot of other rock crawling areas, but uh, in Utah you're looking at those two are kind of your premier destination rock crawling places. And because of that, you're going to see a lot of portals and big tires. Uh, it used to be back in the day when you had Jeeps, if you went to a 35 inch tire, that was kind of the, the holy grail of tire. And then it went to a 40 inch tire. And, and now, you know, we're, we're starting to see, you know, side by sides on, you know, 35s, 36, 37s, and even 40s uh, inch tires, which is, it, it's just crazy. Uh, a lot of those machines are now kind of, like my own, it, it was a multi-purpose machine. I, I had a, a stock Polaris Turbo S on 36 inch tires. It had suspension done and I could drive that machine anywhere, the sand dunes, the mountains. Um, but if you really want it to excel a rock crawling, you know, obviously I changed, changed mine up a bunch and now it's mostly a rock crawling machine. But in Utah, we have a lot of mountains. Um, we've got a lot of machines, like you said, that, you know, who can slap on the gas cans and chainsaws. We've got some huge mountains. Um, with the Rocky Mountains, you know, I'm right out my window right now. I'm looking at the Wasatch Front, just amazing mountains. So we do a lot of mountain riding. Uh, we do a lot of desert riding. Uh, then we do a lot of sand dunes and we do a lot of rock crawling. So you're going to see machines from really one end of the spectrum to the next, which is kind of makes Utah unique. When we hold a ride, a lot of people, if it's at the sand dunes, you know, their machine may not be a sand dune machine, but they bring it out anyway. And so uh, in Utah, you'll see really from one end of the spectrum to the next, which is kind of kind of unique in utah so you know your uh car um you can go through the build out if you want um the it has i think you're up to 40s now um I am. and you have i think blink i believe you have a uh, four inch portals on it how do the portals i mean that's kind of a constant conversation up here in the northwest if someone should go portals or not because everyone thinks that they're not durable they're not going to last uh they can't go fast they can't do some of the more adrenaline seeking stuff that they would typically do here in the northwest um you know how do those hold up what's been your experience and, and kind of what uh what kind of um direction would you point somebody to if they're thinking about going higher like that that's a great question because i've always been um i'm kind of the, the portal holdout guy i was the guy that wanted big tires but i didn't want portals um, because I didn't want to, one, jeopardize my ride. I didn't want to jeopardize my reliability. There's a lot of things that I was afraid of going to portals. Would those things prohibit me? Um, and so now having done that, I've got two machines. I've got my, I've got a four-seat Turbo S. My wife has a four-seat Turbo S. We did not portal her machine because uh, we thought, you know what, let's, let's see. We, I actually loved the machine the way that it was. I had the suspension done. I had, a, you know, the suspension lifted it a little bit, had big tires on it. It ran amazing. It did great at the sand dunes. It did great rock crawling. And uh, so going to portals for me was something that, you know, it was kind of a leap of faith. Like, you know, I, I've got a lot of buddies that run portals. They, they swear by them. They love them. Uh, so I, I bid in on it. Um, I, I put portals on my, on my car. I had 36s already. So I decided, you know what, let's put 40s on it. So I put four inch portals and 40s on it. Uh, the machine is actually a beast when it comes to rock crawling. Um, I love a rock crawling. I did lose some of the rides. So I do got to go back and kind of tweak the suspension a little bit. Um, because I'm not, you know, for a rock crawler, you, you would never notice the difference, but uh, getting out to those rock crawling trails and, and, and areas, um, you do have to hit some whoops and some dunes. And I'm not a guy that just likes to go slow and, and putt out there. We wanted to, we wanted to kind of rally out there. 
and during takeover we we led the night rides and um if anybody was on the night ride we had to go bomb through the dunes and go all the way back to um you know top of the world at, at uh, sand hollow i was leading the the uh, night rides on my machine with you know 40 inch tires and portals out mobbing through the sand dunes and so for me um i, I i've I've abused them already pretty pretty hard for the first uh, little while that I've had them. And so I, if anything is going to break, I'm probably going to be a great test person to to say, hey, if the, it, are these reliable or not? Because uh, we were hitting sand dunes, we were hitting whoops, um, and these are big tires on, on portals, and, and we didn't have any issues. And so for me, um, I, I've actually been fairly surprised at how well the machine does. Uh, we even ran it in the grudge uh, drag racing um, events that we had a takeover at, at night. And surprisingly, the, the machine with the, the gear reduction and the portals and the gear reduction, and the transmission, it actually did really well. I mean, the, the track isn't super long. I think it was, you know, like 300 feet or, or maybe even a little bit longer, but the machine actually beat some other machines that we didn't think it would. So it actually without does paddles. really well. Yeah, without paddles. Just big 40 <laughs> inch tires. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. So uh, you just mentioned um, that the, the, the portals themselves have a gear reduction in them. Are you at a 30 or a 40%? So the, the gear reduction on the portals is 30%. And then I actually have in low range another almost 30% in, in low range. So when I put it in low range, it's like... In the 60%. transmission. Yep, in the transmission. Yeah, so it's like 60% lower in low range. Uh, high, I'm at about uh, 18%, so about 48% lower in high range. And this machine will do still still do sixty to seventy miles an hour, so it still gets up and goes. Um, but it uh, it does have when I put it in low range, it is it is a crawler. Yeah, it sounds like it would pretty much just slide over anything at that point. Um, in high in high range, can you actually get to those speeds in the whoops, or is it only like on straightaways and pavement that you can get up to seventy miles an hour? I can. I I didn't hit seventy in, in any whoops. Um, I I did get it going pretty good. I mean, in those night rides, we were doing 40, 50 miles an hour through the sand dunes and, and mobbing around. And a lot of people came up to me afterward, were like, holy cow, you know, I saw you hit some of those dunes. Um, it actually drove really well. Um, I don't I, I didn't heat them up, so I, I didn't get a chance to fill them, but uh, I was actually pleasantly surprised um, uh, at how capable the machine was as far as not losing power, going to big tires and portals. It still has a lot of power. And I do need to work on the the suspension a little bit uh, it's a little bit choppy but the dunes were terrible riding for not just my machine but others uh, it was just a bad time because you know we didn't have a lot of wind it was very rutted out and so uh, it was kind of abnormally rough anyway but it did it did awesome so uh, i believe you have some uh, hdr suspension on there um and it, are you wider than the original 72 out besides your besides the big wheels are you are you wider or did you stay at that 72 so I just, uh, I, I stayed with the 72. Um, uh, I did I did go with HCR. HCR is another company that we're proud to have that's actually based out of Utah right here in Cedar City. So they're, they're a big partner of ours. Um, so we, we did run their stuff. We're sitting, that machine's sitting right at, a, um, right at about 90 inches wide right now. Yeah, because so you got uh, the four inch portals, which add another eight inch width to the machine, I believe. And then yep. you have those huge 40s. Uh, <laughs> yes, on a twelve fifty, uh, on a twelve, you know, forty by twelve fifty. So we're sitting. My trailer was like ninety. I want to say ninety four inches wide, and that machine is sitting just over ninety inches. And so we were, it, we were squeezing it in the trailer. But it was one of those <laughs> if it fits, it ships uh, mm-hmm. memes that went around because it's a, it's a big big machine but it fits i saw a picture uh, on on the group that you had posted of, of it fitting in there just just squeaking it in there that was pretty impressive i was stressing because uh <laughs> if your machine doesn't fit the day before takeover uh you either have to rent a trailer or buy a new one so it was going to be a very <laughs> either expensive or a logistical nightmare to get that machine down there but we lucked out in the fit yeah that's that's pretty awesome um so to get in back into the group and what's going on uh, up here in the Northwest, we have a few key members of the groups that are uh, huge advocates for uh, small community legislative change to get these UTVs uh, street legal and to get them to uh, be allowed to go from camp to town to the trails and back and forth. And and um, it makes a lot of sense when you talk about a community's infrastructure to bring in those tourism dollars to say that you can bring your machine down here and, um, and support the local economy. Uh, but it also makes a lot of logistical sense when you talk about not having to have a hundred trailers in town or to have, you know, 
the loadout area and the, and the trailhead to be completely overrun by uh, vehicles that are, are supporting these machines. Um, you know, when uh, we look at the community and, and how they're supporting the efforts here, it seems like there's very few people that have the knowledge to actually push this forward and the drive to do it, but a huge community to support them. And uh, in in Utah, I know that there's a, there's already been established a lot of open areas to ride. Uh, there's been a lot of openness to ride in, the, in certain towns, in certain counties. Um, but what kind of spurred this whole like uh, motivation to be more involved and to be more vocal in the community when it comes to um, getting these things uh, either newly into communities or to retain the rights that you have in communities when it comes to, to allowing these UTVs on the roads? So that, that, that's, been a, that's been a want that the OHV community has had forever is, is uh, if you go to Moab, you're probably going, you know, you're either staying at a hotel or you're driving your your trailer or your motorhome, and you're you're, you're camping, um, and then trying to get that machine to a trailhead uh, where you can actually drive it has been just just a nightmare. Um, and Moab was a place that they didn't allow you to drive on the street. Now there's other areas in, in Utah where you don't have to be street legal um, to drive on the street. They're just at, they're actually very OHV friendly. Marysville, Utah, uh, Hurricane. These are places that are very popular that the local community has decided you don't need to be street legal. So you can actually come out here, park your motorhome, your truck, your trailer, uh, and drive your OHV or your UTV or side-by-side, -side, whatever it is, you can drive it from there on pavement to a trail or, or to a riding area without being street legal. Uh, the, problem, the, the problem really came into, you know, Salt Lake County and Moab, some of these other areas where there's nowhere to ride. And if you wanted to get there, you have to trailer your machine. Well, if you've been to Moab, there's very few trailheads that are big enough to support the trucks and trailers for the machines that drive those trails. And so uh, what was happening is a lot of people were driving their machines on the roads in Moab illegally. And so they started cracking down on it. And so it really came back to the OHV community as, hey, how can we fix this? How can we make it so that I don't have to pack up my huge motorhome and my 30 foot trailer behind it and, and drag it up the hill to Hell's Revenge um, just so I can, you know, go on a trail. And so the OHV community kind of, kind of got together and there's a lot of members from UTV Utah and other groups that pushed for a street legal bill. And, and really we just wanted, we wanted the ability to ride some of the canyons here in Salt Lake. How can we drive up these canyons and then hit a trail, um, to get out of Salt Lake County. And there just was not a way to do it without a street legal bill. And so we, we actually went to the county. We went to some of the legislators and said, can you just open up these these main canyons so that we can drive our machines up there and hit a trail and get out of Salt Lake County? And they said, you know what? No, we just don't see that can happen. Well, we worked with legislators to run a bill that um, instead allowed us to street legal our machines and drive them anywhere besides uh, interstates and, and highways. Um, and surprisingly enough, the, the bill passed. And it actually passed um, with a you know, majority of legislators voting for it. Um, you know, there was some money involved. We, uh, we changed the registration fees. We reallocated how the money was being spent. Um, and so some of that money actually goes now to maintain roads and highways and, and uh, other pavement um, that's out there. And so there was a lot of money that we put back into the system because we figured if you're going to, if you were going to ride on it, we might as well pay for it. And so uh, it, it actually passed uh, with, which, with flying numbers, a lot of UTV Utah members went and testified at the Capitol. We, we pushed for that legislation and uh, we got it. it. It passed. And so since then, you know, we've been trying to kind of um, utilize that. Um, we have more machines on the roads now than we ever have. And uh, Moab is, is awesome because now you can park your, mo your motorhome or your trailer and you can drive right from your campground right to the trailhead. And so it, it prevents congestion, emissions. I mean, it's it's been awesome for for some of these destination places too. So uh, this was at the state level, right? This wasn't like a, a city thing or a county thing. This was actually the state level to say this is a actually a state sponsored bill that's going to be, or not sponsored, but a state approved bill that's going to say throughout the state, we're going to allow these things as long as you're licensed, you, can you got your, your fees paid and all that stuff. And then you've passed inspection, you're allowed to then trail right on these trails, correct? Exactly. It was a, it was a bill that was ran um, at a state level by uh, uh, a senator, uh, House representative that they, they put forth the bill. 
And it was, you know, there are a lot of hoops that you got to jump through just like you would any have to any other street legal machine. So you got to have mirrors, you got to have a horn, you got to have trim signals, all a windshield, you've got to have all of those things. Um, and then also carry insurance. Uh, and then the price of registering your machine goes up because once you are street legal, you have to pay um, a road tax as well. So we pay an off-road tax, we pay a road tax. We, in Utah, we pay more fees to register our machines than any other state, um, which, you know, as an OHV community, we kind of wanted to put our money where, where our mouth is. And we actually put it out to the OHV community and said, hey, if we put this out there, you know, would you guys be okay with paying more to drive on the roads? And the unanimous decision was absolutely. If I'm getting something for what I'm paying for, why would I not do that? And so they, you know, we've got over 200,000 registered um, OHVs in the state of Utah. And we've got, you know, know, tens of thousands of street legal machines now that are out uh, driving the roads with all the proper um, registration and insurance. That's awesome. And, and so how long ago was this uh, bill actually accepted into law? So that, that took place, um, I want to say, uh, my brain's going to gonna probably lose it here, but I want to say that was in 2016 is when that bill actually took place. There was, there's was there been several amendments made. Uh, the amendment might have been 2016, but it could have been as, as early as 2014. We've made amendments since then. We actually ran a bill last year, uh, which was a very important one. And this is one that we're going to talk about is that we we ran an amendment last year to our street legal bill that made it so that a municipality could not discriminate against a particular machine, meaning that they couldn't say um, this road is available to drive a car, a truck, a motorcycle on, but you can't drive a street legal side by side on it. And that bill actually passed unanimously with 100 percent in favor. Um, and that passed two years ago. That's a big one because now that's uh, that's one that's we're going to talk about that's coming up in Moab is they're they're actually trying to exempt themselves from that particular bill. So to to clarify, there there's uh, the issue is that these counties were saying, you know, yeah, you're street legal, you've paid your fines, you you're contributing to the system that maintains these roads, you're doing all the good faith stuff, but we're going to exclude you because of X Y Z reason. And so the bill that you put forward said you can't do that because. We're, we're an active part of that that funding process where we've we've done all the process to get legalized and now you're saying we can't just because you don't like it. So the bill you put forward said treat everybody equally unless you have a valid reason to treat us separately. Exactly. And it's and we, we have not had an issue with with a county. Uh, all counties have been receptive. Uh, every city has been recept, receptive with the exception of, of uh, now Moab City is a entity, a municipality that is, that is pushing back and trying to say, you know what, we don't want side-by-sides uh, on, our, on our roads. Uh, uh, and so they've got to actually fight that with legislation in order to get that law changed now. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, how this whole storyline in Moab started. So a lot of us in the community at large uh, have been hearing a little bit about what's going on over there. Uh, Over here in the Northwest or the West Coast, we hear a lot about them trying to shut down dunes for various different reasons. Um, And, uh, you know, that's those are all individual fights that we have to step up to. Uh, But in Moab, what kind of start what what happened there? How did that start? When when did this are all happening? And and kind of what's the scenario at the moment? So right now the the scenario is, and this kind of this kind of transpired last year. Um, actually met with the mayor of Moab City last year, um, and, and what they're having is uh, they're having a problem with noise. They're having a problem with machines um, with aftermarket exhausts that are incredibly loud, and driving you know not only during the day but driving all hours of night. Uh, Moab is a fun place. It's a fun place to go night riding. It's a fun place to go out and, and play. Um, but we, we have to understand as side-by-side owners, we still have to be respectful because when our trip's over, we go home, those residents don't get to, they live there. Uh, they, they have to deal with the side-by-side community, the OHV community. And so they, uh, you know, they're getting frustrated with a lot of the noise. Um, and so I, I do validate them in the fact that there are some machines out there that are just incredibly obnoxious. And so we, we are asking people to you know, do a couple of things. When you come to Utah and you come to Moab, slow down, you know, turn down your radio. Let's be, we're, we're asking everybody to be respectful because uh, we do value their opinion. We don't want anybody to, to hate us or, or target uh, side-by-side owners. 
Um, and so we are asking people, hey, you know, in your town, slow down, turn down your radio, be respectful. Um, but there is a group out there that that is in Moab that just flat out does not want side by sides there. Um, and the problem we're dealing with is a lot of these people went to, to Moab, they traveled there, they loved it, they moved there. And now that they've moved there, they're trying to change it. You know, they don't want anybody else there. And so there is a group that oddly and sadly enough, no matter what we do as far as service hours, um, no matter what we do as far as education, they're just not happy. They don't want you there. And, and sadly enough, they have gotten a mayor of Moab City on their side and they are pushing to um, ban street legal side by sides on the streets in Moab. That is actually what they're going for. They're trying to exempt themselves from state law that says that we can drive on their roads. Um, they're trying to exempt street legal side by sides uh, from driving on the streets of Moab. And so it's it's a battle that we are faced with. And it's a big one because it sets a precedence for not only Moab City, but other cities. Uh, no other city is complaining like Moab. In fact, a lot of the other cities in Utah and other counties in Utah hold events to bring visitors in. And so Moab is kind of unique in the fact that they are the one that's actually targeting uh, the tourist group that that's one of many that keeps them very busy financially. Um, you know, Moab thrives off of the off-road community. Um, but, you know, they also have a group that just doesn't want you there. So it is a fight we're faced with and it's we're fighting it right now. So the first part of the problem is the people that are pushing for this change. The second part of it is the people that are not respecting the community around them. Um, you know, as a community member, my job is to one, be responsible with how I act, but two, to also influence those around me. And one of the things that, um, you know, we can do individually is to just, hey, hey, buddy, I'm just being your friend. I just want to let you know you're being kind of a, a prick out here. Like, just take it easy, take it slower, like, you know, take it easy on the drinks, like just slow down a little bit and, and leave it, leave it open for the rest of us. Right. Um, there's always uh, going to be that one guy at the party that's going to just have no regard for anybody but himself and his good time. But, you know, we in our off time can just bring that up, be vocal about it. Um, and then there's some education that I think goes into it as well. Like, you know, when you do put on aftermarket exhaust and you do do these, uh, these ECU tunes and these, and these high horsepower machines, like, um, you know, you're going to get louder. You're going to change the tonality of your exhaust. You're going to do these different things that then impact those around you. Um, simply knowing how loud your machine is, is a very important thing. If you're in a county that has, let's just say like a 95 decibel threshold or a 105 decibel threshold and your machine's 135 at full RPM, how would you even know that? Like, going into that. So I recommend to people, if you're going to be doing these upgrades on your machine, just download one of the free decibel apps on your phone and just get a, I mean, it's not going to be hundred percent accurate. Nothing on your phone is going to be hundred percent accurate, but at least you would know at idle and at high rev exactly where your car falls in line. And then if you are putting around town, then you at least know where you're going to be at, you know, half RPM and, and you can be respectful that way. And then the other part of it is just don't be that guy pumping his dual 12 subs in the the back of the four seater like just cranking it all night long like nobody wants that guy around so um part of it's us being respectful part of it's us being communicated uh communicating to our buddies um but it's really hard to do that uh in the bigger group right so how do we influence the bigger group how do we communicate to the bigger group that you need to be respectful of these communities so that, that that's that's kind of the key education is crucial um in moab you have two different two different types of groups you have one that's the uh, locals and out of staters that have their own machines that come out there, they may or may not be on social media. Uh, even though we have a group of 23,000 here in Utah, it's a very large group. But when you get out on the trail, you'll you'll quickly realize that we represent and we only have contact with a small number of the actual people that are on the trails. Um, so one thing we, we always do is hey, invite people to join to join the group because we do a lot of educating in the group and let people know hey. Like you said, don't be that guy. Don't be the one that has to crank a stereo up. I like a loud stereo as much as anybody. In fact, I got like my stereo bumps. It's fun, but there is a time and a place for that. Uh, and it's not in town driving around. Um, it's, you know, it, it's when I'm out somewhere else. I'm by myself type of thing. Um, so, I mean, just don't, 
don't be that person. And then there's there's another group that is the the new group. You know, they're new to the side by side community. They've never done it before. They may or may not know trail etiquette. They may or may not know to stay on the trail. They may not know to ride with respect and, and, and take out more than you take in. And and um, and then we also have another group that is the renters. Uh, these people come in, and if you've been to Moab, you'll see there's tons of places to rent machines. Um, you know, you, you give them some money, your credit card, they give you a helmet and you're off. I mean, there's very little education that goes into, hey, what should I do when I'm out on the trail? And so we can do a better job when you're out on the trail and you come across people that may or may not know what they're doing. Um, you don't necessarily need to be confrontational, but you can be educational and informative and let these people have, hey, dude, um, you know, I, I noticed you, you went around that obstacle, you, you know, and, and this is a big problem in Moab. They see an obstacle and maybe they can't climb it. So what do they do? They try to find a way around it. Well, you can't do that. In, in Moab, you either have to hit the, hit the obstacle or a legal bypass. Um, if, if you're do, going around a bypass that is not open, it's illegal. That's how we get trail shut down. And so we, we ask people, you know, educate others. The biggest thing we can do as an OHV community is police ourselves. So if you see somebody doing something stupid, Hey, bring it up to them. You don't need to be confrontational or be a jerk. They're going to get very defensive and, and probably not listen to you and, and attack you. But you can go up and say, hey, hey, man, I don't know whether or not you knew this or not, but you shouldn't be doing this. Do it this way. And a lot of times if you approach it in that aspect, uh, it will be well received versus, you know, trying to get in a fist fight with somebody for, for them acting stupid. I think the, the, the way that's kind of worked well for me is that, you know, when you approach them, you, you meet them, you shake hands, whatever. Uh, but then you just say, Hey, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but in our area, we're having a problem, you know, with, with some of the legal issues with what we're doing out here and we're trying to promote a healthy community in these systems. Um, you know, I saw that maybe you did this. I just want to let you know that that's one of the things that's, that's causing these issues. And we want to help you know a better way around that. Um, and, and maybe suggest a different uh, trail, a different way, a different, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and just try to be more educational in your approach versus condemning of their actions. Yeah, and that is spot on because um, you know you'll see people all the time that are confrontational. Then that leads into just an altercation. Nobody wins. Uh, but if you are educational, like you said, and informative, and say, "Hey, man, this is what we're this is the battle we're facing," and if you can, you know, not only change your ways but let others know that that doesn't work. Um, Word of mouth goes a long ways, um, and so that's that's kind of the direction we would like to take. Uh, we'd also, uh, you know, we're in, we're in the fight at this point now, though. I mean, the, the Moab City has hired legislators, they've hired lobbyists. This is a fight that obviously right now we're faced with, and so the education is a is a crucial part, a crucial part of the of the fight. But now more than ever, we need we need OHV users um, to make their voices heard, and whether or not you're in Utah or not. Um, is irrelevant. If you if you recreate in Moab, the, these new laws and, and things that they're setting forth will affect you when, when you come here. And so we're you know we need the OHV community as a whole to step in and kind of rally around these causes, whether it's in Utah or California or like you said in the Northwest. Know that it, it you know if you need need some help uh, on a cause, groups like UTV Utah can help you out, and, and, and we're here for that. So let's talk a little bit about the kind of that worst case scenario. If they get their way, what's going to end up happening? Because right now you have the freedom to uh, get an Airbnb or a campsite or a whatever and, and and simply just drive from there to the trailhead and go. Um, at its face value, it doesn't look like that's a big deal to maybe somebody on the outside, right? Um, yeah. But in reality, when you have, let's just say, 500 cars in city to go recreate that weekend, you know, what does that look like when that option gets shut down? It's a logistical nightmare. Um, if, if you've been to Moab, um, there's one trailhead that's probably one of the more popular trailheads. It's called Hell's Revenge. Um, it is Hell, Hell's Revenge Trail is, is probably the epitome of Moab. It's got some amazing scenery. It's got some fun obstacles. It's not too that difficult because it does have bypasses that you can legally take to get around obstacles. Um, but if you have more than 20 machines or 20 trucks and trailers at that trailhead, there is no room for anybody else to park. And so, if, uh, and at any given time, it doesn't matter on a busy week uh, weekend or not, you're probably, there's probably anywhere between 100 and 200 machines out on Hell's Revenge at any given time. So trying to park a hundred motorhomes and trailers or trucks or trailers 
at Hills Revenge Trailhead is just absolutely impossible. And so, you know, from an OHV standpoint, um, it makes us wonder, is that um, strategic in the fact that if you can't park there, you can't ride there. So is that one way of preventing the OHV users from recreating in Moab is, hey, let's take away their ability to park at trailheads. And, and then eventually do we just go to an assigned user where you have to draw out to, to ride a, a public trail. And so for, for us, it's, it's, it's a wrong way, a wrong direction to take. It's, it's a lot easier for us to address the actual issue, which is if it's a sound problem, if Moab City has a sound problem, um, one, let's enforce the noise ordinance. If somebody's obnoxiously loud, let's, let's give them a ticket. The side-by-side -side community, we're all for that. Uh, let's weed out the bad apples. Maybe a couple of guys that have obnoxious machines or maybe they're just obnoxious in how they drive them or turn up the radios. Let's give them a ticket. I have no problem. Um, we can educate people that way too. And so um, for us, it's more about addressing the actual issue rather than targeting an entire user group based on the actions of a few. Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, kind of the main takeaway from, from the approach that they're taking at the moment is, you know, politics is a funny thing where a lot of us hate it so much that we just ignore it, but we don't pay attention enough to know exactly what sneaky ways they're trying to do things, right? So uh, trying to take away the, the in-town access and the impact that has on the trailhead um, is really going to be a defining moment of how we move forward with it. So if we can't get them refocused on the actual issues at hand and hold them to that candle, like they're just going to take it off from there and go whatever, however deep they want to go and however more oppressive they want to go. So, um, you know, I think it's important to understand not necessarily the approach itself, but the side effects of the approach. And um, I think I was talking, I don't remember if I was talking to you or somebody else, but talking about the resorts and the things like that that are all involved in this, you know, they tend to win either way. They're either going to get a bunch of really rich people moving in to, to pay for a lot of this stuff and to be at their their diners every weekend or or whatever. Um, or they're going to have UTVers there spending money at their diners every weekend. So, um, you know, if we're coming across and saying, well, let, they're just legally trying to do this, we're just going to boycott it and not show up. Um, all we're doing is handing it to them on a silver platter uh, because we just already started the process of vacating the area. So if exactly. we if we actually take that route, we're going to lose it a lot faster than if we actually just stand up for what we already have and try to fight to keep those rights. Yeah, you're you're spot on. That um, it would be great, um, you know, if if they knew the financial impact that the off-road community has. And I'm sure they do, um, but a lot of them are not afraid to lose that. And so for us to think that we could boycott our way to and getting our, our way here is um, extremely arrogant and selfish because there is another user group that will pick up the slack and and pay the money to recreate in Moab. And so like you said, if, if, we, if we've decided to boycott, we're essentially just saying, hey, here, here you go, we're, we're, we've, we've given up. And so our, our opinion is, you know, don't do that. Go recreate in Moab now more than ever. Have fun. Do it smart. Um, follow the law. Be, be respectful. Um, you know, and then, and then when the time comes, you know, let, let your voices be heard. Let, let the legislators know here in Utah, and you don't have to be their constituent because, you know, some of these legislators that are, that are looking at running this bill in Moab aren't even from Moab. And so for, for somebody that's outside of Moab to run a bill in Moab, uh, it tells me you don't have to be a constituent of, of Moab City or even the county that Moab is is in, which is Grand County, in order to let them know, hey, I, I'm opposed to this. You don't even have to be a resident of Utah because this affects you. Um, and, and you know, I for for me, uh, it, it's a big deal because, like you said, if we allow this to happen here, we kind of set a precedence for other areas in, in Utah where if you get enough people that don't like you, they can discriminate against you by by the type of machine that you drive. So let's let's talk a little bit about actually supporting uh, the initiative to to keep this all in check. So the first step that I think we can talk about that it's an easy one for anybody that recreates is to be respectful of the resources we have. So one of the big issues we have that we've already mentioned is driving around obstacles in areas that and this is this is fairly specific to the Moab area because a lot of places don't have these rules, but you have to follow the, the marked trails or your you're acting in an illegal fashion. So uh, being educated, not being impatient, taking your time, do it the right way. Uh, but then we also have things like trail cleanup, you know, pack it, pack out what you pack in and leave something better than you found it. Yes. Um, you know, those are huge 
those are some of the two biggest things that legislators will come against a group for is uh, not obeying the rules and polluting. So, um, you know, in Moab, I know that there's been a lot of posts around finding trash in the holes and, and not cleaning up after yourself. You wreck your car and you, you dump your cooler out and, you know, yeah, you'll pick up your beers, but are you picking up the rest of the trash that you had strewn out? Right. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's, there's some effort that we can put in and not be lazy to protect the resources that we've been enjoying. Right. Um, are there any of those other things that you can kind of identify that we can be a part of on that side of it? And we'll move on into the other side. Absolutely. I, I think, um, I, I think you hit the nail, the nail on the head, um, you know, ed- educating people, let them know, Hey, now that you're part of the off-road community, these are things that we expect you to do. One, we expect you to pick up after yourselves. Um, we actually expect you to pick up after others too, because if you see somebody that's left trash behind, um, be the bigger person, pick it up for them. Um, and, and if we do that, you know, we're, we're going to, to kind of set an image that, you know, we're, we're picking up after ourselves. The, the side-by-side community has exploded within the last five years. It's gone. I mean, it's just gone crazy. And with that, there's more people out on the trails. And so when people tell me all the time, well, there's you know, more side-by-side uh, people leave trash than anybody else. Well, of course they do. That's just based upon math alone. When we have a, a hundred machines, hundred side-by-sides out on the trail and you have five Jeeps or, or 10 bicycles, just by sheer math alone, we're going to leave more garbage. And so can we do better as a, as a side-by-side community? Absolutely. We, we need to do better. Um, one thing that I do want to emphasize is that uh, the citizens of Moab that, that are complaining, a lot of them do have valid complaints. Put yourself in their shoes. If you lived on a corner of a busy street and you had side-by-sides going up and down your road all hours of the day, 2, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning uh, with the radio blaring, would it drive you crazy? Absolutely. So we can't discredit their opinion. We have to validate their opinion. Yeah, we, we agree. That is an issue. How can we fix it? And so that's you know, it, 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 like you said, Zach, it comes back on us. We need to do a better job uh, on on our own by picking up after ourselves and educating others. Uh, on the trail in the town, there there's there's three things: rules, you know, respect, and and picking up after yourself, um, and leaving it better than you found it. Right. Uh, when we get into the leg- legislative side of things, when we start getting into the politics of all this, there's two things that we have to uh, support. One are the people that are fighting for us and two being vocal when the, t- when the opportunity strikes. And so uh, who's who in your area for these for Moab and the surrounding communities, Utah in general, um, you know, who's leading the charge on these? Who can we support and how do we support them individually uh, with their efforts and, and the groups that, that are, are funding that? But then also, how do we support the bigger narrative and how do we become more informed to act when, when the time comes? So th- this that's probably the single single best and biggest question um, that I can answer it. And because a lot of people want to know, how can I help? Or they find out too late and realize, Hey, what could I have done to help? And at that point it's too late. So, um, what we, what we ask people is it doesn't matter if you live in Utah or not, um, join UTV Utah. We're a free Facebook group. You can join, you can actually become a member on utvutah.com. It's free to join. Um, and then if you want to, if you are a big proponent, proponent of keeping public access open, you can actually become a paid member. We're a registered nonprofit. 100% of the proceeds of anybody that joins UTV Utah goes into keeping trail access open. And whether that's with uh, a lobbyist, uh, if there actually happens to be a lawsuit that's filed, your money will be spent in places to keep that open. And and obviously this is always the last resort. If this is at the point where the OHV community is backed into a corner and now we we have to fight to keep what we have. And so that's, that's why UTV Utah has kind of exploded in the way that it has is because the OHV community wants a voice um, and they want a voice that um, that pertains to side-by-sides and UTVs. And so we ask people, go, go join UTV Utah. Uh, we will keep you informed as to which legislators are pro side-by-sides and pro OHV and pro public access and which legislators are not. And I just got a phone call, you know, right before I'm meeting today about the the legislator that is going to run the bill. So Moab City couldn't find a local legislator to run a bill that says we're going to discriminate against side-by-sides. They could not find a local legislator because a lot of these guys understand, hey, this this is a moneymaker for a lot of the businesses. 
a lot of the businesses are afraid to say, hey, I'm pro side by side or pro public access or pro OHV because um, there's another side to that that is very cancel, cult cancel culture and they will, you know, boycott their business. So they don't want to hurt their business and so they don't say anything. Um, so I just got a phone call before this meeting about a legislator in Utah that the mayor has gotten that's going to run a bill that proposing to ban street legal side by sides in Moab. He does not represent Moab. I'm not quite sure why why he would even want to. Um, but this information is going to come out on UTV Utah. We're going to you know post information of who to email, who to contact. That's the single biggest thing that you can do um, because when we put out our press releases and we let our members know, hey, this is what's going on. Um, we start getting phone calls from council members, whether it's at the county, whether it's at the city, and saying, "Holy cow! You know what? You guys, um, you guys need to call off the dogs. We got a lot of people calling and, and telling us their opinion." Well, we don't do that for the simple fact that we didn't start this fight. Um, we're just letting you know that hey, we don't we don't agree with this. Uh, we don't agree with what you're doing. And so, to answer your question, uh, there's a lot of OHB groups in Utah. UTV Utah is the largest. Um, as far as locally, 23,000 members, um, you don't have to be in Utah to join. Um, but we would say, hey, join, follow the page. Uh, you'll find a lot of information. And when the time comes, take the two minutes to make the phone call or send the email because those, those comments carry far more weight than, than you would ever imagine. So you have uh, the UTV Utah uh, group, and then you also have a UTV uh, Utah info group. Uh, we do. And that is a public page, whereas the Utah uh, UTV group is a private group, uh, free to join, free to be a part of. But to share content out of that group to your social media, you'd have to be on the UTV info group to, to share that info. So um, I noticed that, yeah, you're 23,000 strong on the on the UTV, um, Utah UTV page, but on the info page, you're only about 10% of that. So, um, you know, I would say that you probably are best to join both of those Facebook groups so that you have the ability to be part of the discussion on the private group, but also have the ability to share and promote off of the public group uh, as well, because you're going to be posting resources on that page because that's where it needs to be sh shareable, correct? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Facebook is weird in the fact that a, that a private group like UTV Utah, you can't share any any posts out of that group. And, and it sucks because we post some great information on there, but it can't be shared publicly. And so we had to create another public uh, page. It's not a group, just a public page that we share that information on as well. It's UTV Utah info. And like you said, it's our public, kind of our public face where it, uh, the good content that comes out of UTV Utah, we share on UTV Utah info, and then you can actually share that info right from UTV Utah info. So any of your friends can see it. They don't have to be a member of UTV Utah, uh, the group, to see it. And so, yeah, that's, we do have the two. I would suggest everybody, um, if you're out there, go to UTV Utah info, just click like, and then go join the group UTV Utah as well. So uh, when we talk about moving forward and, and having uh, some of these bills trying to be introduced, uh, is there any preemptive stuff that we can do as community members before it's actually, you know, part of a voting process or part of a dialogue process in the boards or whatever? Is there a preemptive things that we can do as a community? Absolutely. So the, the county, and I, I'm going to use Mobile as, as an example, but there's lots of other fights that we're fighting in Utah as well. Um, we've got a big recreational area here called the San Rafael Swell. It's a beautiful area with you know thousands of square miles of riding. It's actually enormous, um, and we're, we're fighting a environmental environmentalist group that is trying to close it down to uh, not only OHVs but dispersed camping and mountain biking. Um, so, what happens is a lot of these cities and count and counties hold council meetings, and that's to get feedback from the public as to what's their opinion on this. And so what you can do is we'll post that information. We'll post a, an email or a comment period with the website. We'll post all that information on UTV Utah. And then it, you know, we'll, we'll even help you out with some of the verbiage as well. So uh, we'll make it easy. Click on the link, go in and give them your thoughts, um, submit it to the council members. And that lets them know ahead of time, hey, this is what the public feels like so that they know whether or not it's smart to run a bill. They don't want to run a bill that, that's bad public policy usually, um, but if it's something that they're very that they feel very strong about, even if they are in a minority, they'll search out for a legislator to run it. 
but we'll post that information on UTV Utah. It's, hey, click on this link. Let them know how you feel. Let them know that, you know, we don't want this area closed to uh, camping and, and uh, OHVs and, and everything. That information will all be posted on there. That's the single biggest thing you can do um, to preemptively stop legislation is if a legislator knows, hey, this is just not a good idea. The public's against it. Uh, make your voice heard. That's kind of um, – kind of what we shoot for and tell you back in the corner. And then, then the same thing happens, but you have to contact legislators. So one of the hardest things as a community member or just a person in, in local communities is to understand the fact that we're lazy and we don't like to follow the local politics and, and be informed, you know, to sift through all the other stuff that's going on. Um, and that's where having a community group like this really is as beneficial to you because you're not having to sit through budget meetings. You're not having to sit through, you know, whatever legislative things for, for a school district or something like that are, that are going on. You can actually just focus on, hey, we have a group, core group of people that are figuring this out. We have all the information for you. All you have to do is act on it. And, you know, we're, we're pretty lazy. We don't want to do anything. But if someone's going to already do all the work for us, then at least what we can do at the bare minimum is act when, when the opportunity comes. And so, um, you know, hats off to your core group of, of investigators over there that are, are digging into all this stuff. Um, anybody you would like to shout out for, for their hard efforts over there? Yeah, so we've, we've got a group that, um, you know, I, I get to be the face of the group, but I'm really not the, uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the boots on the ground, man. Like you said, the, the investigators, we call them ambassadors. So we've got a group of UTV Utah ambassadors, and these are key figures in the public space in their area. So we've got ambassadors in Moab. We've got, we've got ambassadors from the top of the state to the bottom of the state and, and both sides. Um, and these are the people that are in those meetings that make it easy for us. So that what, that, what will happen is ambassadors will port, report back in an ambassador group that we have. Uh, they'll report back to the group, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we need to do. We'll brainstorm and then we'll actually put it out to the members and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's out there. And so um, if I could give a shout out to anybody, it would be our UTV Utah ambassadors, because these are the guys that are actually in the trenches um, finding out what's going on. And these are the guys that either their business is affected um, or that's in their backyard, a trail's being closed. These are the guys uh, that deserve the support. Not me. I get to get up here and, and, and talk about it. But at the end of the day, it's those guys behind the scenes that actually make this stuff happen. And so you mentioned a little bit, uh, you know, the, the group's free to join, but you also have memberships that you can be a part of the group with. Um, you have different tiers, you know, obviously the free group, but you also have some like gold and platinum tiers uh, that you'll get, you know, some some benefits and some swag and, and some all yeah. stuff like that. Um, but there's there's two ways that monetarily that you can support these initiatives, right? That's one through memberships and then supporting the companies that support the actual community group as well. So can you speak a little bit towards how memberships fund some of this and then also maybe do some shout outs to the companies that are supporting the group that are enabling some of this? Absolutely. So um, I'm glad you bring it up. I love talking about this because a lot of people, you know, when they buy something from somebody, they want to know, hey, they either one have to like the product or two have to have some sort of um, investment of, Hey, where's that money going? You may not like the shirt, but you know, if my proceeds are going to keep my trail open, I'm going to buy the shirt. Um, And then that's what, that's kind of where UTV Utah is. We try to, we try to have merchandise that people like, but at the end of the day, a hundred percent of any of the proceeds go back into uh, keeping trail access open. We don't have anybody on salary. Nobody takes any money from UTV Utah. We're all volunteers. And so we all do this just because we like it. I do it because I have two little kids, two little boys. They're seven and nine years old. They both have razors. If I don't fight to keep their trails open, um, they're not going to have anywhere to ride. And so for me, it's, it's very, um, it's very personal because I, I enjoy doing what I do, but I want my kids and my grandkids to be able to do it too. So, uh, one is, like you said, go in, um, you know, you, you can actually donate, you can buy merchandise, that money goes right back into the system, or you can, um, you know, support the businesses that support us. And so we've got some awesome businesses here in Utah that do a great job. And I know I'm going to forget a bunch um, when, when I kind of run down the list here, but we've got some great, um, so, some, some great companies. And so I'll start off with, you know, some of the shops uh, around here in, in the Salt Lake Valley that, that do a good job. And I would say, um, you know, Rollover Motorsports is one of them. Uh, we've got Combustion Motorsports is another one. We've got um, some of the whip companies out there that help us. These guys make some awesome LED whips. You've got Rocket Whips. You've got R1 Whips. We've got Gorilla Whips. Uh, some of the cage companies out there that do a great job. 
that actually support UTV Utah. These guys, they'll donate product to, to do giveaways for people that will join UTV Utah to keep trails open. And so we've got Vent Racing is a big one. You have RSK, you have Sandworks. Um, we have, um, you know, other shops, m m Automotive, uh, Carmel and Polaris is another one of our big sponsors here, here in Utah. Uh, Carmel and Polaris has four dealerships uh, and they sell everything from Polaris to Can-Am. So if, if you're going to buy a machine, we highly suggest, you know, take a look at them because if you buy a machine from them, you know that they're going to keep your trail access open. They understand that if they can't sell machines, they're not going to, you know, if you can't access trails, they're not going to sell machines. And so these guys, they do a great job. 80 triple S is another one. Um, uh, we've got, um, I saw on the membership page, you even have some, some companies that are, are giving gift cards with the membership and things like that as well. They are. Yep. We've got companies that get, give gift cards. Uh, Rocky Mountain ATV is another local company that, that they're based locally, but you, you know, they're, they're nationwide. They're, they're huge. Uh, they, they do a great job. Um, we've got, um, just a lot of, a lot of good companies, uh, Roto, uh, Moto Armor, um, HCR Racing is another one that I mentioned earlier. They do a fantastic job. Great company. Um, just just some some good good companies. You can actually find some of our partners right on our website. And so for those of those, I know I'm forgetting some companies, and they're going to say, hey, "You forgot? You forgot me?" Go to <laughs> we'll, our website. We'll include them. <laughs> yeah, go to go to the website. You can find them all on there. These guys, um, you know, they're they're in the same space that you know they do as much as they can. So they may not be able to, to cut a check to, to help, but what they do is they'll donate product for us to raffle or to do a fundraising. And so they give back that way. And so we always tell our, our members, Hey, support these businesses that are local because you know, they're the ones fighting the fight for us as well. And they, and a lot of those businesses tend to lose as well. So if like places like Moab do get shut down, like with the memorandum that's, that's already been put in place where businesses can't open now, like, yes. like that's a huge part of it, right? The economic impact of that is huge. It's not just the people out riding. There are actual businesses that can't even like expand out to Moab at the moment because, you know, and they may have already put in the permits. They've already might, may have already purchased the land. They may have already done some of that and they're already getting cut off. So this is, this is how dire the, the situation is in Moab is one. They've already canceled every single uh, side by side and UTV event in Moab. They've, they've pulled permits. They've canceled any event that's going to take place in Moab. What they've done is, like you mentioned, they put a moratorium on any businesses that are UTV related. You can't open a business in Moab that's UTV related. Uh, the next thing that they've done is they've prohibited any businesses that are currently there from um, expanding or selling their business or handing down that business to to maybe a sibling. If, 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 if the mom and pop are going to retire, they can't even hand that business down to their child because of the moratorium that the Moab City Council has put on place. And it's directly towards UTV businesses. It's not mountain biking. It's not jeeping. It is directly towards the side-by-side -side community. And it's just really, quite honestly, it's offensive. In, in this day and age in the United States of America, where we consider ourselves to be a very capitalistic country, um, why are we targeting specific businesses? Um, it's just, in all honesty, it's, it, it's appalling. It's amazing um, that somebody even try to do that. But they're doing it. And so right now, more than ever, we need... We need the support, not just here in Utah, but we need anybody out there um, to, to jump in and fight this fight with us. Awesome. So uh, like we said, join the Facebook groups, both of them. Uh, if you if you have the means, go ahead and support a membership with them. Get some swag, get some of that uh, stuff on your car. Um, you reach out, see, you know, to the members in the community that are discussing these things, reach out, see how you can help individually, uh, be ready to act when, you know, people call, uh, upon the community to do things. Um, it doesn't take more than a few minutes to do an email. It only, you know, if you're somebody that can, that can manage a phone call with a politician, you know, jump in on that conversation as well. Um, you know, it, it, if we don't act, I mean, like you said, fastest growing industry, you know, in basically the country and we, we have to support our rights. Otherwise, uh, all that money we're investing in this recreation uh, activity is going to be lost. It is, it is, it's, it's, it's insurance to ensure that the, that machine that you bought, you have the ability to drive it and you have the ability to take your family. For me, it's a, it's a family event. Um, I take my kids, they have their own machines. For, so for me, it's, 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 it's what we do on the weekends. And so to have that in jeopardy, um, I'm not going to go down without a fight. Just so, just so everybody knows, we're we're here. Um, we're we're going to fight the fight. And the more people we have, the better our chances are.
All right. So Facebook, uh, Utah UTV, uh, Utah UTV Info, uh, Utah or UTVUtah.com. Anywhere else that we should be uh, paying attention to? No, you can check us out. We we do. We're terrible on Instagram. Um, we don't <laughs> we don't do as good a job as we should on Instagram. I'll just be honest with you. We're we're getting better at it. Most of our stuff is all on Facebook. Uh, so join the group. It's free. Um, like I said, worst case scenario, um, you know, you don't have to buy anything. We're not looking for for your money. If you, if you, this is this is kind of UTV Utah's philosophy. It costs a lot of money to buy a machine. It costs a lot of money to go out on the weekends. It costs a lot of money for a truck, a trailer. We understand that this hobby is very expensive. Um, so if you can't afford to buy a membership, at least join for free because your your voice is worth something. And for us, many voices make light work. So the more voices we have and the, and the bigger voice that we have in the community, it makes our job a lot easier. So take two minutes, become a free member. Um, as a worst case scenario, that's, that's what we want you to do is just become a free member. And when the time comes, like you, like you said, Zach, support us in the, in our efforts when the time comes and, and you're called upon to do so, we could certainly use the support. Well, I know, uh, after visiting, uh, Utah for the first time, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, this has been a kind of an eye opening experience for me to see just, ama- first of all, how amazing and beautiful the, the state is, uh, but also just how, uh, how, be- uh, just awesome of the, the opportunities to ride are with all the different terrains and, and topography and all that stuff. Uh, you pretty much have endless opportunities. And so if you're, if you're somebody that's out traveling, uh, I highly encourage to put Utah on, on that list and then, uh, you know, support them while they, while they are in these fights to, to keep it open. So, um, great talking with you. Uh, look forward to, you know, your progress and, and the efforts there and, uh, best of luck with the fight in you in Moab. And, uh, until the next time guys, Peace.